The really frustrating thing about being a principled pro-choicer in this country is the company you keep. Case in point, CNN, the news media, pretty much everyone on the left, uh, like this uh, Elliot C. McLaughlin guy. Now, this article. I know someone else does the headline, but come on. How the Supreme Court recalibrated the abortion debate in just three words. Recalibrate? I think someone's trying to sound smart here, but you're not. You don't know what recalibrate means. No. <laughs> recalibrate makes no sense. Redefine, reformulate, reevaluate, reconstruct, reconstruct, reshape. Reshape. They reshape the abortion debate. Those are, are things you can say, but not recalibrate. Recalibrate makes no sense. Recalibrate has no, what are you calibrating? What are you, what measurement are you adjusting? That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Oh, yes, I noticed their trigger laws. Yes, someone's triggered. All right. So, yes, we're talking about the overturn of Roe v. Wade and how the opinion skewered the crux of the conversation going forward with just three words. Unborn human being. But it is an unborn human being. That's what it is. Are we just going to start denying the reality of the situation here? What the Supreme Court did is say that there's a conflict of rights between the woman's right to bodily autonomy and the fetus's right to life. And so it shouldn't be up to the courts to just, you know, strike down and say that one place or another. It should be up to the state legislatures, you know, the people's elected representatives, to work that out democratically. That was what they said. So uh, you'd never know that if all you knew uh, is just uh, what um, the news media has been uh, covering on this. But I have a two-part video where I go over it in. Pretty good detail, I think, for a lay person covering it in about an hour. But, but yeah, let, let's not... There, there seems to be the, this thing about where, oh, we're just going to completely ignore that it's a person, and then all of a sudden when it's, a born, when it's born, all of a sudden magically it becomes a person. How does that even work? So... It may seem like a semantic argument. Experts say it's anything but. Gotta love those weasel words, right? Experts say. That's how you can write an opinion piece and call it news. Because, oh, well, no, this isn't what I'm saying. It's just what the experts say. Yeah, we'll, we'll see who these experts are. Actually, I'm not going to go over who the experts are in any great detail. Other than to point out that they're not biologists and they're not legal scholars. They don't, they're not actually experts in any sort of relevant field. So like they start off here with a religious studies professor. Not even like an expert theologian. A religious studies professor, so. And keep in mind, before anyone tries it, because I know you're going to, I'm a pro-choice atheist. Okay, so I'm just pointing out the absurdity of some of the people on my side of the argument because I want to use better arguments than that. For people who aren't familiar, mine is based on a consistent, universal, universally applicable set of deontological ethics derived logically from first principles. And that tells me that if one person is invading the person or property of another, that other person gets to kick them off. And if they die from being kicked off, that's unfortunate. You know, the, the analogy being like there's someone uh, in a blizzard and you're in the cabin in the middle of nowhere and you let him in. You decide you don't like him and you kick him out knowing he's going to die in the blizzard. Well, it makes you a jerk but it doesn't make you wrong ethically, so. 
Now, of course, we're not really talking ethics here. We're talking legalities, which is a different thing entirely. But anyway, the experts say... Alito didn't write God or Christianity or Bible anywhere in the opinion, but his justification is a veiled religious narrative. No, it isn't. Because you see this kind of thing in the law all the time, where you have two people, each of whom have rights to, uh, to do a certain thing or to have a certain thing or whatever. And basically, when you deal with contradictions like that, you have to kind of figure out you know, whose rights outweigh the others and how to, you know, arrange that in the most equitable way. And so that was what the Supreme Court was doing here. They were like, you know, you can't just do this in the courts because in 1973, when Roe v. Wade was decided, abortion was illegal everywhere in the country. And in New York, when they tried just relaxing things just a tiny bit, and making just you know, the the tiniest allowances for other kinds of abortion. People hit the ceiling and there were protests all over the place. So there was never a sense of the people that abortion was a right. And then the Supreme Court just decided to make it one. So. so what Alito was saying is that that was premature. You want people to you know, hammer this out in the state legislatures. And it is different today than it was in 1973. You have a much greater sense of that among the people. But where does that fall among the people? You know, at what point you know, does the rights of one kick in over the rights of the other or whatever? So that's what needs to be worked out in the legal framework that the United States operates under. Nothing about this is religion. Nothing about it had anything to do with religion other than the fact that people just have various religious and non-religious beliefs about this that are kind of all over the place. There's no sense of the country about it. There's no sense of culture and tradition about it. So, Anyway, the majority opinion gives credence to the notion embraced largely by the religious right that life begins at fertilization. That's just fact. That has nothing to do with religion. It's alive. It's cells dividing. That's what life is. You got cells dividing, you got life. I mean, it's just like they're... They're trying to deny that there's any kind of life at all until it's born, and that's just absolutely ridiculous. So, Now, is it life that is respecting of deontological protections enough to overcome the mother's deontological protections of her rights to her own body, uh, her own bodily autonomy, her own property, because we each own ourselves? That's the question. So it erases whole groups of people who have different religious beliefs. No, the original ruling did that. Roe versus Wade did that. The Supreme Court's overturning didn't take sides. There are people who believe that life begins at fertilization. There are people who believe that life begins at birth, and it's fine to kill it even five seconds before it's born, and everywhere in between. And that was why the Supreme Court said that you couldn't um, draw this line, this viability line, especially since they didn't do anything to define viability or give um, any kind of guidance for what that is. And more importantly, there was no legislative basis for it. Because the Supreme Court is a judicial branch, they're not supposed to legislate anything. Concepts like that are supposed to originate either from Congress or from the state legislatures. And then the, the courts kind of figure out what that means based on what they pass. But there was no law passed like that. There was no viability law about it. So it's not erasing 
anything. It's including everything. So either this guy just hasn't read the decision or, or he just doesn't care. Because he's got an agenda to push. When a zygote, embryo, or fetus becomes a human being is far from an objective determination within or across any regions. Yeah, so that's a good reason not to have the courts arbitrarily say, okay, this is where it is, and there's no further debate on it. W which is basically what Casey did. Casey v. Planned Parenthood. So... And I mean, they, they just blow past the idea of viability, which experts believe to be around 23 weeks. But then they're talking about health outcomes or technology. And then that's, that's the question. Is it viability per se? Or is it viability based on the available technology? And if it's viability based on the available technology, that means that viability will come earlier in someone in a big city with access to state-of-the-art medical facilities than it will to someone out in the boonies, who, you know, might not have as much available to her. So. So does it make sense, then, that the that abortion during that time period should be legal for one, but illegal for the other? Various religions have relied on a range of weight posts, including fertilization, quickening, when the embryo develops a heartbeat, insolment, and birth. Um... Again, this person just doesn't know what he's talking about. Quickening, in particular. It was never about when it becomes human. Quickening just means you can feel the baby moving. And before the 20th century, you didn't really have pregnancy tests. Even for most of the 20th century, you didn't have good, readily available pregnancy tests. You had to do some weird thing involving rabbits that I never understood, but... um. For the longest time, and you'll see this in the, the movies and TV shows of the time, they'll say the rabbit died. The rabbit died is a euphemism for I'm pregnant. Because they did the pregnancy test, something about the pregnancy test kills the rabbit. I think it's just the fact that they have to, you know, extract like the liver or something like that. Uh, or, or maybe it's the ovaries. Ovaries would make more sense. But anyway, they have to take something out of a rabbit, put it in the Petri dish, and and tested, so they have to kill the rest. So the rabbit died was a euphemism for I'm pregnant, so. Not like today where you can just pee on a stick. So in those days, before any of that was available, quickening was really the only way to prove that a woman was pregnant. It was an investigative thing. It wasn't like anything fundamental, like it, it's not murder before quickening, but is murder after. It's just about what you could prove. Because if a woman had an abortion, and abortions were illegal going back to the founding of our country or, or even earlier, it's like, how do you prove that a crime has taken place? Well, you have to have a witness say, yes, I felt the baby move. I placed my hand on her womb. I felt the baby move around. That was the only way you could prove that any crime had taken place. So, yeah, again, he just doesn't understand the issues or the history or how any of that happened. And continues on with the same bogus point, just like in Christian sects, there are chasms of disagreement among other religions, not only regarding personhood, but also a woman's bodily autonomy, making holy texts a troublesome barometer for whether abortion should be outlawed. Well, good thing they didn't rely on that then, right? What they were doing was acknowledging that there are all of these different opinions on it, all of these different approaches, and it wasn't up to them to arbitrarily decide which one of those was the correct one. The court shouldn't do it. The court should never have done it. Work it out yourselves in the state legislatures using the democratic process, and we'll go from there. That was what they said. By co-opting the term unborn human being, it signals which religious voices get authority and power in our country. Oh, shut up. Just shut up. Just everything, the stupid guy writing this article and the stupid woman he's quoting is saying, 
like this. We've allowed a minority religious belief to curtail the rights of the majority of women in the country. I feel like I'm in the middle of a dystopian novel. Do you want more pro-lifers? Because this is how you get more pro-lifers. If I hadn't based my pro-choice opinion on some pretty solid ethics from first principles, you guys would have basically drop-kicked me over to the pro-life side. I mean, seriously. And, and again, we're seeing that they don't even believe what they say. They espouse a principle, but they don't apply it. Like, the attitude that a woman would have to justify her decision to others is rooted in religion. It's her decision. It's her body. She should be the only one to get to decide. Oh, really? Okay, so, um, what about COVID vaccines? You against uh, vaccine mandates there? What about uh, the war on drugs? Do you think she should have the bodily autonomy to put heroin in her body? Or what about just a prescription drug? that the FDA says you can't get over the counter, should she just be able to get that? Put it in her body? What about prostitution? If it's her body, she should be able to have sex with whoever she wants to, for whatever reason, including reasons of money, right? Right? Consistent. Not consistent. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference between consistently applied principles and people just making up whatever crap to push a narrative? All right, then they go into polling, which is pretty irrelevant. I mean, because they're saying things like, oh, Muslims 51%, Orthodox Christians 54%, things like that. Again, showing that people are all over the place, and then under that, making sure that they've got this uh, video um, thumbnail in the way. Those numbers are black and white, of course. No, they're not. <laughs> they're all over the place. Uh. Besides, if it really is the case that most people are for abortion rights, then that should be reflected through the democratic process, right? And, I mean, th these... You don't really... They're just lumping all these things together. A lot of it depends on how you ask the question, are you in favor of all abortions, even up to, you know, five minutes before the baby is born? Well, most people wouldn't go that far. In fact, most people from a lot of polls I've seen, would only go up to the point where there's a heartbeat. So they're taking all of these different um, opinions and different polls that ask the question in different ways and just lumping it all together. So That's just not a good way of doing it. Uh, Islamic scholars, as if I care what Islamic scholars say. That's not only doing. Oh, look, here's a, a Jewish law expert. Well, we're not a country of Jewish law, are we? So, how does he have, you know, expertise? Expert in Jewish medical ethics. Sorry, I'm scrolling through here. Just none of this has anything to do with the Supreme Court decision. Nothing about it had anything to do with religion. None of these opinions are relevant. The conclusion of Orthodox Buddhist scholars... Oh, come on! Jeez. The perspective of Hinduism. They also believe that God forgives sins. I'm just going to go scroll. I'm going to go to the bottom. I'm going to go to the conclusion. Okay, here we are, back at the bottom, the original woman we were uh, quoting at the beginning. 
This last paragraph, pitting women against their prenate is a fiction we are now building our legal system around, and I think that's very dangerous. But what else could abortion possibly be? You've got a life growing inside you. You want to say, well, I want to end that life and end the pregnancy. Aren't you the one pitting yourself against the prenate? Isn't that exactly what's happening? Can, can, can we just be honest about it here? So, apparently not, because she says, the problem is the belief that life begins at conception is a theological belief. It's just, I don't know. I think it's a bit of a false argument in the sense that it's not a theological belief that people are fully autonomous individuals with legal and human rights. Well, it's at least a philosophical belief. I mean, it's a belief that we look at from a standpoint of ethics, and we do the same with the fetus. We do the same with the unborn human being. And that's the, the principles that we operate on. This is just special pleading. This is no more than, it's different because I want it to be different. That's what this is. The idea of fertilized eggs should be afforded the exact same rights, but we're not just talking about a fertilized egg. The, the, come on! The law in question over this was 15 weeks. Not conception, not a fertilized egg, 15 weeks. It's not still a fertilized egg at 15 weeks. You know, and so they're just, they're, they're making it out like the Supreme Court said, oh, you have to ban abortions from the beginning. They didn't say anything of the kind. They didn't say anything remotely resembling that. This is just lying to people about what the Supreme Court said. If it's a willful lie, it's bad. If it's an unwilling lie because they didn't bother to read the Supreme Court decision like I did, then it's still a lie. In fact, it's even worse of a lie. Because if you're not going to bother to find out what someone said about something and then complain about what they said and the way they said it, then you're pretending to act with information that you do not have. And that's the same thing as a lie. In fact, it's worse because it really shows a kind of premeditation there. Oh, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to make up crap. And that way, when I get called on it, I'll just say, Oh, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. We see this all the time, don't we? Down in the comments, almost every single video, someone pulls this crap. And I call them on the line and say, But it's only a life I meant to. I just didn't know. I didn't know that you had 25 videos on this subject when I said you never covered it. Well, you didn't even bother to do a search, did you? And that being the case, that means it was premeditated. You didn't bother to look because you wanted this out when people called you on it. So it's actually worse than a lie. So... The idea of a fertilized egg should be afforded the exact same rights. It's fine to have that belief if you don't impose it on others. That's exactly what the Supreme Court said. They just said it about your beliefs as well. And, you know, that, that was what... I mean, I'm not even sure where the Roe and Casey courts got it from. The idea of, of viability or any of those other criteria they came up with. Because, like I said, there was nothing like that in any sort of legal jurisprudence leading up to those decisions. Roe versus Wade, there was nothing. At Casey, the only thing there was was Roe versus Wade. So where outside of that, you know, do, do you have, do you have this sense of law and culture and tradition, you know, about all abortions being legal up to viability, whatever that means. Where does that come from? Well, they just made it up. Unelected people in robes 
made it up. And so the Supreme Court just said that's wrong. It should be knocked around by the democratic bodies duly elected by the people. And now the leftists are all about, oh, well, they're enemies of democracy. How are they enemies of democracy if they're saying let's do it through the democratic process and not arbitrarily, you know, by unelected people appointed for life? Of course, I, who am consistent, would say that not only are the principles of abortion what I said they were earlier in this video, I would also say that it's actually the job of the Supreme Court to be an enemy of democracy. Because if democracy says that, oh, we're, we, we voted that people don't have these rights, we just saw that with gun control, a right that is enshrined in the Constitution, is very much a part of the culture and tradition of the people. And they're passing all these crazy laws anyway. You know, so the you know Supreme Court ups and says you can't do that. But they're an enemy of democracy. Well, they should be. Because democracy, as Plato knew, was a tyranny of the majority. And so when that majority goes against the rights of the minority or even the one, the Supreme Court is supposed to step in and put a stop to it. That's why this whole situation is crazy, and the people involved are crazy as well, so... I have been talking here for, oh, half an hour. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to call it quits here. I think that's really all that... Uh, can be said about this article anyway. So thank you very much for watching. Comments for the common God, shares for the share throne. Please hit like, subscribe, and the bell. Oh boy, just looking through the analytics, this is what does it. You know, liking the video, subscribing, sharing it everywhere. I'm not getting that my click through rate is actually pretty good. It's like five to seven percent. You know, most channels would love to have a click through rate that high, but that's of the people that YouTube condescends to actually show the video to. And it's just not showing it to them. Because the actual views I'm getting from click-throughs are really low. They're supposed to be the vast majority of your views, and mine aren't even a third. So, so that helps more than you know. Just sharing this video, all of my videos, sharing them everywhere. And, of course, going to donate.bogosity.tv. You can donate with uh, PayPal or cryptocurrency. Uh, or become a supporter at Patreon and subscribe star. Get all these videos early and ad-free, the monthly AMA and all the other benefits. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, stay strong and be free.